Hello and welcome to our bookshop in Tring and another lovely book launch. Uh, welcome to all our friends over the other side of the pond as well, including, dare I say, AJ. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. This is uh, my first reading for the, the book launch and it's just really exciting to do that with you guys. So I'm just very grateful. And No, no, really I love how you call it a reading. It's, a, it's not a phrase. A reading, it's a conversation. It's not a phrase I've heard before, but it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a very sweet, you will, I think, do a little four minute reading at one point, but um, okay. yes, predominantly you're going to be chatting to us and everyone in the audience, you are supposed to be sending questions in using the Q&A function on the... Um, uh, on the bottom of the screen, you'll see a QA and a function. So do use that. And um, and also Lucy, hello, thank you for joining us. Hi. Uh. Well, AJ, AJ's about, I don't know, eight or 9,000 miles away. Uh, Lucy is about 400 yards away. So um, there we go. <laughs> but listen, um, so I'm gonna disappear for, a, a, um, for half an hour or so, leave Lucy and AJ to chat about the wonderful uh, new book and, um, Guys, I'll see you in about half an hour, but keep the questions coming in, everyone. So I'll see you in a bit. Okay, um, well, AJ, welcome to Tring. Welcome to our bookshop. Um, you are slightly further away than, uh, than some of our guests, but um, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. It's um, one o'clock in the afternoon with you, isn't it? That's right, yes. Yeah. I'm so excited to be here as well, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, you are here today to talk about your debut novel and it is its book launch here in the UK. It is called Girl in the Walls. Um, I have it here, um, which I have obviously read um, and we're going to talk about it in a bit more detail very shortly. Um, despite only releasing today, um, you have um, clearly had a buzz about you because it has already been billed as the most anticipated gothic novel of the year. And one review has called it the best gothic novel I've ever read. So, um, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to discussing it in a bit more detail with you. But before we do, um, you were going to give us a little extract from it uh, to give us a flavour of what the book's about. So if you wanted to start with that, and then when you're done, we can um, kick off with some questions. I'd be happy to, yes. And we will be sneaking in a little reading after all. Um, I'm going to read you a section from where the tension kind of picks up in this book. It is a gothic book, so it kind of flips... Uh, uh, some tropes on its head where you think, you know, some of the protagonists are doing things that might be, you know, something unexpected or something a little mischievous or something a little darker. We have 11 year old Elise, she's returned, she's an orphan who's returned to her family home. Um, and she's actually living in the walls in the attic spaces and kind of retreating into her own grief there. Uh, unfortunately for her, uh, the other family that actually technically lives there um, is gradually becoming aware that those noises they hear in the middle of the night, uh, that bump uh, down the hallway might actually be a person. And two of the, the, the teenage boys, um, they wait till their parents are out of town because the parents don't believe them. Um, and they bring in someone they find from the internet um, who believes them that they've got someone living in their walls and is very willing to come. And as you can assume, that's the exact kind of person you don't want to invite to your house um, to come help you with this problem that you have. Um, the person who arrives, Mr. Troust, um, is, tells the boys, okay, we're going to tear apart your house to find this person. Um, and the, the section I'm going to read for you is uh, his reasoning, his justification for why it's so important for him to find the people that are hiding in our walls. The chat, name of this chapter, uh, because all the chapters are titled in this book, let's see, is uh, what it means to find them. There's a story the man grew up with that he's thought of often. He can't remember where he first heard it, who told it to him, whether he dreamt it himself. Another story about a haunted house. A man inherits a house. It is huge and its rooms and hallways tumble after one another like a ball downstairs. It is remote and he must make sure all the lights remain turned on. The house has many lights. The overhead bulbs burn 100 watts apiece with lamps positioned in the corners of those rooms, their shades taken off and the naked glass glowing bright and hot. The air is sickly warm with the heat day and night. Even the closet lights are on. In cabinets and dressers, flashlights left on roll and clank against one another when the drawers are pulled open. The man finds spare light bulbs stored in boxes in the corners throughout the house, thousands in total. The bulbs have hundreds of different styles and shapes, tubed and twisting, fluorescent, hexagonal, and pear-shaped. 
with the heat all around him, even when he is alone, it doesn't feel that way. At first, out of curiosity, he turns out a light and a, and a slow flickering feeling builds in him. It feels as though something lost is now swelling and it has a sour, rotten smell. His fingers fumble with the switch. When he turns the light back on, the feeling leaves. He wipes the sweat from his brow, suddenly grateful. He lives in the house for some time. When the bulbs burn out somewhere in the house, he knows it wherever he is because the feeling is there with him in that little dark building. The man is frantic to replace them. He's noticed how in the patches of house where the light doesn't reach, there are dead things, insects, spiders, mice. When a fuse burns out in the basement, drowning that room in darkness, he realizes he's lost it. He boards its door shut. But the lights are always burning out and he is not always quick enough to catch them. When he turns a dead bulb, removing it from its socket, it feels as though the thread will never end. He must resist the urge to wrench the bulb free. In that pocket of shadow, he feels them there. He feels their fingers upon his forearm, pressing their nails into his skin. They've been here the whole time. Eventually, the story ends when the whole house is dark. You boys ask me what it means to find them, to catch them finally in the beam of your light, to see them there beside you when you've known that they've been there just beyond the edge. It's to remove the mask of the world, to pull off its face and see the wiring beneath. When you grow up in a house like yours, not like this, no mansion, nothing this big, but a house like this in that it is a house with the sounds of a house and drafts and locks and spaces hidden away, a place with angles that prevent anyone from seeing everything at once, a house where no one believes you. And each day you're home, scribbling your homework, eating your meals, flipping through your television channels, straining step to step through the day's particulars. And somebody's up there breathing in the attic each day grows you into something a little different. In church, they tell you of God and the devil and the keen difference between them. But when you're a kid at home in a house that's supposed to be empty, hearing a door somewhere close come open, what difference is there? There's you and there's everything else. Every object and thought turns against you and all you have is yourself and knowing. But once you know, know like the feeling of those fingernails pressing into your forearm, you can fight. You can resign yourself to the fact that you'll die trying to find them. You can have that certainty. But when you don't yet know, you're alone and nothing else helps you. I've gone a hundred lifetimes without knowing, seems like. I've gone longer than you will understand without holding them here in my hands. I want to see their face. I want to see a face and take it back with me to show everybody who didn't believe, everybody else who's lived a hundred lifetimes without knowing. Mr. Troust, Eddie, one of the brothers said from down the hallway with his voice shrinking as he spoke. This isn't about us, is it? Boys, Troust said. Now, how's about you go check the closets again? AJ, thank you very much. Uh, that was a real treat to have a, an extract actually read by the author. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, we're gonna come on to the plot um, of the book of which you've just given us a flavor very shortly. But I just wanted to ask you, I mean, obviously it's launched in the US already and this is your launch here, but what, I mean, what a start to 2021. Um, what has life been like for you? What is it like to launch a book? It's, it's been crazy. And that's actually, I haven't even launched in the US lately. So this is my, my initial, or launched in the US yet. So this is my initial, you know, first launch in the, in the UK. And it's, it's wild and it's surreal and it's, it's, you know, an extension of 2020. So, you know, 2021, the pandemic and everything. So in some ways it's, it's, you know, the same old usual. And at the same time, it's, it's anything, but, um, and it's, it's hard to, to know what to compare it to because it's my first time publishing a book. Um, but it's, it's very exciting. It's, it's very strange. <laughs> so tell us a bit about you. Um, how have you ended up sat here launching your debut novel? What's brought you to where you are now? So I um, have always kind of been interested in writing since uh, just high school. I went to an arts program, um, which uh, was really wonderful for high school to, to kind of be able to study for, I think, just a couple hours after school and these, these writing intensive programs. 
Um, I studied creative writing in, in undergrad, and then I took some years off and ended up getting my master's of fine arts in, in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, there I worked on this, this book project, um, and I didn't really know what to expect. I've never tried writing a novel before. I'd only been writing these really short flash fiction pieces where it might just be you know, one page stories. Um, and um, my goal for this book was honestly just to see if I could write a novel. I, I wasn't sure if I, I could have something with the beginning, the middle, and the end. Um, for the class I was writing it in, uh, my professor, Nita de Gramont, actually uh, made us on the first day say, okay, say what your wildest, you know, unhinged ex expectations are for the book project you're about to begin. And don't be modest, just, just put it out there. And being completely sincere, I was like, I just want something that exists that like one person read and maybe likes. That'd be really cool. And that person could even probably be me. Um, but to, to have, you know, just completed the book and then to have it out in the world and to be talking with you, you know, across an ocean and you having read it too, it's, it's and everybody else being here, it's, it's beyond belief, it's wonderful. Oh, it must, it must just feel surreal. I mean, it, have you, yeah. I think with, um, with the situation with lockdown, it must have been tricky, but I mean, have you actually, have you been able to see it? Is it, in, is it will it be on bookshelves? Will you be able to go and see it in the bookstores or? Right. Um, I, it hasn't been in bookshelves yet. It's, it's on my bookshelf, but which is pretty cool. But um, <laughs> yes, um, but I've, I've gotten some photos from um, some, some friends and, and some, some colleagues uh, in various places that have been able to see it. I've been seeing it on Instagram. It's, uh, we released actually a couple of weeks ago in Australia. Um, so it's been really fun seeing it on the shelves over there. It's, um, it, I would imagine that first moment when you walk into a bookstore and see your book um, on the shelves it will be spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the plot itself, it's, I, I felt like it was a story, a story of grief, um, mm -hmm. of survival, um, about the importance of relationships. And I, I felt like it was about the power of hope. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. when you, without giving away too many spoilers, I know you spoke briefly about it earlier, but I mean, what, what kind of, if, if someone was going to pick it up today, can you give a, can you give them an idea of what they would expect from it? Right, yeah. So I think it is primarily it's a, it's a meditation on grief, on kind of coming to terms with the things we don't know as well, like kind of embracing what what scares us, not only just about you know spooky stuff in the house, but also about what scares us about losing what we love, whether it's a family member, whether it's it's a house, whether it's you know an environment, a whole you know ecosystem of a home, and um, and then recognizing that we will have to put away those fears that, that there is this level of acceptance that we have to come to um, in, in all sorts of components as well. And I think it, it is, I, I agree with you. I think it's a book primarily about hope because all of these characters are undergoing their own journey to kind of accept that they don't have control over their lives and, and that they, they're not going to know everything and they're not going to know, they will know that they're going to lose everything at one point, but they don't know when and, and they have to be okay with that. And where did the inspiration come from? Where, where did this idea come from for it? Right, so I, it's come from, I guess, a number of directions because I've been working on um, the story for a few years and it's had like a short story format. Um, initially, I grew up in this, this house very similar to the ones, uh, the one depicted in the book, a uh, very old and cumbersome, very noisy house that, that's, that seems like someone's living in there, even, even when they're not clearly, hopefully. Um, but uh, just a lot of unexplainable noises. And, and unfortunately for my parents, they, they still live there and they, they still deal with that. And they're, they're not always happy that I wrote this book and they're like <laughs> aware of that. They love me and they love the book, but they're like, yeah, we still have to live here, Adam, sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, so, Initially, it was just kind of growing up in that house and, and loving that place, even with its, its all kind of all of its creepiness. Um, I had a conversation with a close friend of mine um, in, I think it was 2013, we were driving down St. Charles Avenue. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, it's this beautiful road, uh, kind of in the heart of uptown New Orleans with all these hanging uh, oak trees, these live oaks with the Spanish moss hanging down. Maybe there's not Spanish moss there, but in my memory right now, there is. Um, and it's this really beautiful, basically like a Gothic street in real life. Um, and he was telling me um, that he'd been living at home and um, alone, and he'd been hearing these noises lately, and he'd gotten down this rabbit hole of, of researching um, people who have videos and who, who believe that there's people hiding secretly in their homes. 
Um, and it's terrifying. You can YouTube it and find like all these, these terrifying videos and, and you can find these message boards where people are convinced by it. It's, it's unsettling. And there's a lot of news stories that come up where it happens. So it, it does happen. Um, but hearing him, it was this weird kind of reaction I had because yeah, it's creepy, but at the same time, I, I felt this deep comfort in, in hearing him talk about that because my first thought was like, oh, I'm not the only one that like has that weird thought that like, oh, I think someone's living here. And there was this, um, or sneaking around me in the middle of the night, watching me through the, the ceiling vent or something. And um, that, that, was that, that was the kind of germ for the story where you can have people connecting about a shared fear that's, that seems illogical, um, but um, just trying to mix the creepiness of it with something that's a little bit more comforting. And, and that's kind of how that, that story came to be. And so um, Norse mythology is a common theme throughout the book, a recurring mm -hmm. theme. Um, can you tell me a bit about how that sort of was bedded in? Um, is that like yours or how, how did that come about? Right, yeah. So it seems a little incongruous to have a bunch of Norse mythology in a, in a uh, New Orleans sort of Gothic story uh, in the, the pseudo swamp here. But I felt like, there were a lot of really wonderful parallels between that, that what initially was a religious tradition um, uh, and this story, because um, I mean, when you're looking through mythology, Norse mythology is really unique because it's one of the only ones where the gods actually die. Um, they are fated to die, they're not immortal, that they're, they're ones who kind of know what it's like to suffer like us because they're not gonna last forever. They, they have to experience these kind of griefs. Um, and I wanted it to have Girl in the Walls to kind of have this sense of um, moving beyond just this particular story of this house, that it's, it's talking about um, all of us having to undergo um, some sort of grief and some sort of, uh, you know, like every house we live in, we buy these houses, assuming they'll be here forever, but that's not the case. And especially in New Orleans, as we all know, with its, its history of hurricanes and, and coastal erosion, I mean, even if we never got hit by another hurricane. There's a serious problem where we're losing, you know, land drastically every hour just because of what's being lost. So I wanted to have this sense of, you know, this, this almost religious component above it where we're talking about, you know, not just this one story, but we're talking about eons of thing, people having to come to terms with, with loss. And I thought Norse mythology fit really well with them. And I also just love those stories. And it was, it was very easy to have, you know, a character fall in love with them kind of in the same way I do. And there was also sort of the element of the father figure as well, wasn't there, that sort of came through in it. Exactly, which, yeah. Which yeah. Yeah, yeah, Odin's a wonderful character. <laughs> and so moving on then to those sort of relationship dynamics, there was a mm -hmm. few that sort of stood out for me. Um, I love the brothers um, and their relationship. Um, I enjoyed um, Elise's relationship with the house, which mm -hmm. kind of felt like, it, well, we'll come on to that in a second, but I felt like it almost made the house a character. Um, and I absolutely loved um, Elise and Brody. And mm -hmm. there was a, a really, a really touching moment that stuck with me where she, um, he, he helps her to locate something of her parents mm -hmm. um, and he, he helps her find it. And even though she has been there such a long time, um, it took him coming into her life to help her find that. Um, and it, it stuck with me. I, I just thought it was such a lovely moment. Um, and so I just wondered, you know, out, out of all of the, the different relationships in it, which one for you was your favorite? Which one did you enjoy writing the most? I, I am particularly attached to the, the relationship you described with, with Elise and Brody, just because it's one that I felt like I needed to work the hardest to get in the book. Um, it's, it's kind of a surprise when it happens. Um, and I think there is a version of this book that's, that's maybe a bit shorter that, that cuts that character out completely and it's a book I, I love less. Um, I think Brody's kind of you know an, an important character to me because he's he's that that idea of that there can be someone just as strange as you out there um, that you know what Elise has to do is she has to pull herself out of you know in a literal sense as well as a metaphorical sense pull herself out of this this house to be able to have this relationship with Brody. She really puts herself in, in danger at some points but um, through this friendship she has with Brody, she's still able to respect the memory of her parents, that he's helping her, um, you know, not just work through grief and, and pull outside of herself, but, but also remember her parents as well. It's, it's not an either or kind of dynamic. And yeah, no, I think it's, it was kind of a surprise, all the things that uh, Brody was able to do 
um, as, as I was working on this book. And, and yeah, I think he's a great kid. So when you first started writing it, was Brody part of it or did he sort of come to you as you were writing? He did. I, I had in the initial kind of whiteboard sketch for, for the class I was working on, um, we, we were just to kind of, you know, just map out the story um, as, as we saw it in that initial just sketch of a house and, and all these little stick figures that was totally illegible, only I understood it. Um, but Brody was a part of it. Um, and I think most people's reaction seeing this drawing were like, there's a lot of people coming in and out of this house, Adam, how are you going to pull that off? Um, but that's kind of what I wanted because I I think deep down I thought it was funny um, <laughs> just to have all these different people sneaking in and out of the house and the family have no idea um, but yeah he was he was there I think from the from the very beginning honestly yeah, and I agree with you I think um I think it would be a very different book without him and I agree I, I think I'd miss him too I, I love the character um so the house I touched on uh, a second ago I, I did feel like you personified that house um, and I loved it. I, I loved the way you did it. So can you tell me a little bit more about that and what your thinking was behind it? Yeah, I, I absolutely love that house. And that was, you know, when you, what you're excited about when you enter into a project is, is, you know, for me, it's honestly setting, which kind of gets me excited first. The idea was I wanted a story restrained pretty much to a house that, um, that you're constantly looking at the house in different perspectives than you would normally and uh, normally would and that you'd be able to appreciate the house um, in all sorts of new ways. So um, being able to experience a lot of the house, not just in its rooms in a traditional way, but from between its walls and from its attic space, kind of listening down or from beneath the floorboards as well. Um, there's, like I said, a, quite a bit of, of, of my parents' house uh, growing up in this, this house where, you know, there's a lot of uh, different projects that went into it. Kind of our childhood was moving from one project to another and and um, just a lot of very interesting things from a house, which is kind of like an amalgamation of a bunch of different styles. Um, and the, the kind of ways that allows for these, these void spaces in a house and allows for these kind of secret compartments that as a child, we loved because it was perfect for hide and seek. But I think it, it's also kind of wonderful to return to these, these places as an adult and still let your imagination run wild in the way that they would as you know as a, as a child and when you brought in um the, the sort of the, the, the nature aspect so mm -hmm. i was talking about new orleans and the fact that you have hurricanes and, um mm -hmm. nature very much plays a part doesn't it you it, it's mm -hmm. throughout this the clock um and it, right. it, it's a it's very much a theme through the book um again was mm -hmm. that was that intentional was that i mean from childhood i mean the clock was so vivid um uh, I just was that from something you knew or did you just come up with that? I, I did largely come up with that. I had some inspiration, um, but the clock in, in the book is very much its, its own object. And I'm glad that worked because, yeah, I had fun just kind of producing a lot of that in my own head. But um, yeah, getting the, the sense of nature, I thought was really important because when you've got a story about you know, overcoming grief and just this kind of natural progression of life, um, I thought it was important to, to kind of break down the barriers between um, men and, and nature, what's civilization, what's a house and, and what's the world outside of it. Um, and just really point that, you know, th these things are much more porous. It's not just these people sneaking into this house and sneaking out again. It's, it's nature is actually permeating this house and um, how the house is really just an extension of, of what's going on um, in the environment around it, uh, which is experiencing the same kind of thing that the house is. The house is um, in, in, in a metaphorical sense, as well as a literal sense, it's in peril, but so is this whole community as well. Um, just, just like what I said with you, the kind of environmental challenges that, that South, Louisiana is, South Louisiana is facing. And so for anyone that hasn't read it and um, that might be watching, can you tell me a little bit about um, the, the clock? Describe it in your own words, the, the clock we're talking about, just in case so it makes a little bit of sense to people. Um, <laughs> so it's it's a granddaughter clock, so um, which is, is kind of fitting for, for the main character of this book, uh, which makes it just kind of a, a miniature grandfather clock, um, but it's it's probably about, you know, chest high or about the height of an 11 year old girl. Um, and it's got the, the face has um, 12 different kinds of birds. So you have starlings, you've got cardinals, you've got a painted bunting. And each time the, the clock strikes that number, you get a mechanical version of um, of the bird call that 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 bird um, that that number is, is pointing to, um, and it's very loud, and you can actually hear it throughout the house. So when Elise is hiding up in the attic, 
she can still hear um, these different birds throughout her day. And sh she's so connected to um, this clock is, is telling her sense of time that she doesn't even use numbers anymore. It's not like it's 12 o'clock. It's like, oh no, that's that's the time of the, the great horned owl. Okay, oh, it's cardinal time. And that's the big bright red bird, which is my warning that people are about to get home, which means I need to get back into those walls, um, which is just this fun kind of way of mixing, you know, that, that civilization image with the, the kind of nature as though it's it's just the nature system that's, that's defining time. It's really clever because yeah, it, it was almost as though um, time didn't matter to her. She was literally describing life as though nature was telling her um, it was almost like nature was looking after her and protecting her because she would hear a certain bird and she would know at that mm -hmm. point there might be risk to her and she would take that as her warning sign. So somehow you, I felt like the, the clock was almost a, a, a more intrinsic version of you saying nature you know, is in charge and looks after us and it was almost protecting her inside the house too. Um, yeah, no, I, I love how you put that and, and that's that's spot on as well. Yeah, I love that kind of, you know, that nurturing, that, that protective thing that the house and the clock and even Odin uh, are all kind of taking care of this girl as she does this very strange and, and highly improbable thing. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about her. Tell us about Elise, uh, the, the key character within the book. Right. So one is that Elise is very good at hiding. Um, she's 11 years old and she's got this really wonderful talent um, for, for kind of sec uh, secreting herself away um, into this house. Now, why she's so good at it is that she used to live in this house with her parents. They worked on a number of projects over the years and she became very kind of intimately aware with, you know, the weird void spaces or, or um, you know, the spots in the attic, the, the spaces beneath the floorboards in the attic. Um, or a laundry chute that's been since sealed off that the, the current residents don't even know about, but she does, and she can use that to hide. Um, she's very playful. Um, she's uh, at times mischievous as well. Um, she's she's very intelligent, and she she really misses her parents. It's she had a very close uh, relationship with her parents. Those were kind of her best friends, and that loss is something that's that's very difficult for her. Um, so that it really wasn't an option in her mind trying to go on once her parents passed away. And that's why she's kind of retreated to this house, which, you know, in every room and, and, and every object that still remains there, she's, she's still seeing her parents in that spot. So um, for her, that's, that's holding on to their memory and, and to them um, by staying there. And we touched on it um, right back at the start when you did your reading, um, you showed us that the chapters all have names. And um, what was your thought process behind that? Because I really liked that as well. Yeah, that, that was um, the, in, the initial idea for it is, is something a little less romantic. I, when I went into it thinking, um, you know, oh, I'm, okay, so I have to write a full novel. I didn't think I could do it. So what I did is I tricked myself into writing very short chapters with chapter titles. So I was thinking each one's a really short story. It's okay, Adam, just like, just keep knocking these short stories out. Um, but in the end, I really liked the, the, the idea of having the titles because I feel like you can do lots of work with these kind of contained um, sections that, that help for telling a story which you know, occurs over a stretch of time and is about a lot of it. It's about the day-to-day -day, um, with overcoming grief as well as the day-to-day -day of how do you manage to hide in the house so long um, and just keeping these kind of contained moments. Um, it also let uh, me kind of approach each section from a different perspective, from a different angle. So there's there's some chapters which are told from the perspective of like insects or or some where it's, it's you know, frogs or, or from the fa different family members. And it really allowed um, for these kind of hopping around perspectives of what this house is like and what Elise's life is like there. And so when you sat down to write it, um how you know people i'm sure ask you all the time but did it did you have the plot ready to go did you know where it was going to end or did you sit down and think i'm going to write and it mm -hmm. came to you as you were going along how did you map it i had it all mapped out but there were certain stumbling blocks i had where you know i was writing it and i was just really unhappy about the direction it was going in there's a, a hurricane that that happens in the story and i was very opposed to doing a hurricane story because I've done that a bit in short stories and, and I was thinking, no, I, I want some other crazy disaster. I want something something else. Um, but it was actually my fiance, uh, uh, Donnie, 
uh, recommended. She's like, Adam, you're good at hurricanes. Do the hurricane. <laughs> and I, I felt this huge sense of relief. Um, and I was like, yes, okay, I'll just do another hurricane story. But I love doing that. I love I love the thematic uh, um, implications of hurricanes. And, and they're just these weird, you know, crazy experiences that that seem almost religious when you're when you're in the middle of them. Um, it's hard to explain. And it works because um, yeah, it's it's a, a really dynamic part of the book. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, that was totally the right the right decision. Um, was there anything as you were going through um, where you said you had it all mapped out? Were there any pieces where as you were writing it, you thought no, this this doesn't work, and so you changed it or went off piece a little bit? Yeah. So there's, I mean this book would be twice as long if everything I <laughs> wrote made it into it. Um, but what was really nice about doing these really short chapters is, is that the pieces were so small that if, if one thing just wasn't working, I could just remove it and then, you know, kind of condense around it, um, which helped a lot. So really what was kind of amazing, because I know this is not the case for most books and, and, you know, I've tried other books and it hasn't been the case for other ones I've done, but, um, the the uh, initial idea of what the story was is is remarkably similar to to what came out with it um, and it was it was a relatively quick book to write i think i'd only done it in about two years which i know is slow for some and but very fast for other ones um but um yeah no it was it was remarkably just in terms of the story itself um kind of what it what it came to be and it's in four parts. Was that intentional? Were you looking to, I mean, is there, is there a sequel? Is it, is it contained? Is it... I think this story is, um, is what it is. Uh, I think I, I kind of like where, where it's ending off on this. Um, I, I actually picked um, five parts, partly because I liked the, the, the weird rhyming um, it has with a, a category five hurricane, because this book is set in, um, New Orleans in 2005, where Hurricane Katrina hit, which is a Category 5. Um, and I did kind of like it having that, that um, tie into nature, where there's this building up. Because um, for those of you who have read the story, this thing builds in suspense pretty drastically. But, um, but also the sense of, you know, hurricanes are a natural pro process. There's a whole hurricane season. Um, it seems like something that's potentially destructive, which it is. But it's also something that's like cyclical, like in the same way we're talking about that time, that clock with the connection to nature. There's there's something like that with hurricanes as well. And so moving on to you, um, who is your favorite author? Who do you like to read? Oh gosh, I, I love so so many of them. Um, I think my um, my favorite author and who I come back to time and again for inspiration is uh, Italo Calvino, um, who wrote you know The Baron in the Trees and and all these really fanciful, wild um, uh, stories about ridiculous, like the bear in the trees is about a, a boy who climbs up into a tree and never comes down again. Um, and uh, I just love the, the, the willingness to, to go there with, with just a fanciful idea and then make it real and make a reader believe, okay, yeah, no, that's, that's what's happening here. Um, and, and let's see how you do it. Um, so He's, he's kind of the one, the first author I read that I, I realized, oh, okay, I can do literary fiction. I can do, I can, I really would love to devote a lot of time to writing stories that, that are about form and about these brilliant ideas that have beautiful language that also are just kind of playful and, and don't take themselves too seriously all the time. Um, but some books I've really loved lately, I think there's a lot of really good debuts out <laughs> right now. I've been reading them. Um, uh, I think I love Milk, Blood, Heat by Dante Moniz. It just came out in February. Um, and I'm reading uh, Emily Stonex's uh, The Lamplighters right now. Girl A by Abigail Dean's really good as well right now too. Girl A, yeah, we had uh, Abigail on. Um, oh, great. Uh, yeah, I loved it too, actually. Yeah. Um, but uh, so when you, the, when you look at your, your favorite authors and then you pick up your book, do you think you can see their influences in your writing? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I guess in terms of like the sentence level, not so much, but just in terms of these big, broad ideas, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not an author that thinks like, oh, I'm just, I kind of live in this vacuum and these ideas are just kind of given to me by, by angels or something. Um, I do feel like I'm kind of responding to authors I love and, and ones that excite me and, and reading their books and, and what um, excited me about them or what excited me about their projects and seeing like, okay, 
um, how would I go to the very seed of that and, and, and try to, to emulate that in, in my own way where it's going to come out like my own book because, I mean, after you spend that much time on anything, it's just going to be your own kind of project. But um, yeah, I, I, in some ways I'm like, oh, I, I can never be anything like them, but I'm, I'm hoping to be like them in that there's that level of like excitement um, that you get from the book that, that might be in the same way. I, I don't know if that's answering your question, but I don't even no, know if I have no. a good answer. <laughs> so when you, if you ever, if you do uh, get writer's block or get a bit mm -hmm. stuck or you're looking for inspiration, where do you go to for that? Is that to those books or is there somewhere else? Absolutely. I do go to those books and I try to think like, okay, so what excited me about this book and, and how can I get myself excited about my own writing in the same way? Um, but in general, I think writer's block, whew, I think that's mostly just my own head. It's when I'm trying to um, edit a story before I've actually written it, <laughs> if that makes sense for I'm trying to write something really, really good on the first draft. And it's like, no, I just got to write something bad first and then it'll be okay. <laughs> ben, I see you've joined us. Did you have any uh, questions? Yeah, subtle, subtle as ever. So now I've got uh, a few questions. Keep the questions coming in, everyone. So um, we've got some, some, some lovely ones here. Um, Susan Armstrong asks, uh, um, how does New Orleans as a setting influence your writing? Absolutely. Um, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. question and hi, Sue. Um, do, you know Susan, I, do, you, do you know Susan? Yes, yeah, she's my agent. So that's, that's oh, is she? Oh, that's cheating. <laughs> that's cheating. <laughs> yes. But yes, I mean, New Orleans, it's, it's where I grew up. It's where I spent the first 23 years of my life. And I'm going back there next week to visit family. And I, I can't get enough of the place. Um, it is, it's hugely influential in, in my writing. Um, just, it's such a wonderfully strange place. And, and it's wonderful that it's so well known that, you know, people across the world are like, oh yeah, New Orleans, that's such a wonderful city. And it, it's true when you live there, like the stuff that's wonderful about it, it's not just this kind of made up fairy tale um, that, that's not actually true. Now there's a lot of problems in New Orleans, obviously it's, it's uh, got a lot of issues, but, but what's wonderful about it is is genuinely there and it's it's um you know the culture there the people like it's it's an incredibly friendly town for for a you know good sized city um and then just it's really interesting dynamic with nature and being that it's in the middle of the swamp where people should not live it's people shouldn't be able to exist in that place um between like you know the heat and the humidity and the insects and the reptiles the actual alligators which we had one in my parents yard not you know, a few years back. Um, it's, it's this wonderful place that's, I think, great for a lot of writers where you just get all this really interesting stuff that work really well on this kind of metaphorical level with each other in a lot of different ways. Mm. I think um, Barbara Hammond asked pretty much the same question, so I, uh, but I, I should name check her anyway. But Barbara, thank you for the question. Um, an anonymous uh, um, viewer has asked, how did short story writing make you a better novelist? That's a, that's a wonderful question. And um, there is something really valuable to, to coming to terms with that arc, you know, having the beginning and the middle and the end and having to have that in a very contained object um, and, and doing that over and over and over again um, makes you much more aware when you're doing that with a novel, because I think when you're working on these big long form projects, what's really scary about them is that you're going to devote years of your life and hundreds and hundreds of pages towards a project that doesn't necessarily go anywhere or that has a beginning and a middle and a middle and a middle. Um, so working on these shorter projects, for me at least, really put that into my head where I'm like, okay, no, you really do need to, to kind of map this out and make sure it's, it's um, you know, has rising action, that has a climax, that, that has a, a satisfying conclusion with that. Um, and then just in that, you know, very simple way I was talking about, we're just structuring this book is, is at least in my head as a bunch of really, really short, short stories um, that, that ultimately made a novel. Yeah, it's kind of a, the writing, writing, sorry, the writing process is a very, um, very personal thing to any author and how they right. do it. I mean, two hours ago, I was interviewing Jeffrey Archer, would you believe another uh, event? And he just sits down at a blank sheet, sheet of paper. And um, no planning, nothing. Just wow. starts starts from the top of his brain. Just comes up with a few thoughts, and uh, it sounds Brilliant. like you're not one of those. 
No, <laughs> no. I, uh, I do a lot of pacing around the neighborhood, talking to myself, trying to sort out the ideas before I ever come to the page. And the, the, the neighbor children know me. Yeah. <laughs> they <recognize laughs> do they? <me>. Yes. <laughs> Weird author neighbor is uh, walking around the block again. <laughs> Muttering to himself. Yeah. Oh, the, the, lovely. Uh, Susan did ask two questions. Let's use um, her other one as well. What was the most surprising and most thrilling part of your publication journey? I suspect meeting Susan has to be the, the, the best part. Yes, yes. Sue has been wonderful, absolutely wonderful, just a great advocate. And just I've learned a lot from her. And I would say, like, what's the most surprising and thrilling part? It's like every day. I don't, you know, I really, when I was writing this book, I did not have plans for publication um, and I did not expect it. To, to be around the world that I, you know, I'm getting Instagram tagged in photos in New Zealand of this book right now. And I'm just still skeptical that it's real. I feel like, you know, it's April Fool's right now. And I feel like that's fitting. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I wish I could just pick one moment in terms of what's surprising and shocking. But, you know, even just that first day of, you know, when Sue sent this book out on, on submission, um, hearing back that someone was interested in publishing it and still I'm never going to forget that and just thinking like really like me like wow <laughs> my thing um who is that did, wonderful. How, how many publishers were there interested at the, at the time at the time it was actually the the initial one was preempted so um it was um over the over the weekend um I think Sue sent it out on Friday and then by Monday we had an offer which was absolutely wonderful with Fourth Estate and Helen Gardens Williams was the one um, putting that together um, and she edited the book. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. So it, it was just a remarkably quick turnaround. Brilliant. That's, I mean, that's the best way for it to happen. And um, I mean, did, how did you meet Susan in the first place? I may as well have a little chat about Susan. Finding an agent is often, and I speak to a number of wannabe authors who come in the shop and... Um, and they, you know, just getting a, a uh, somebody to believe in their book, an agent to believe in their book, is 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 often the hardest part of the. Of, mm -hmm. uh, so, how did getting was getting uh, Susan an easy part of that step? Well, it's it's pretty awesome to be able to get an agent in general, but to to get one as good as Sue, who's, who's represents you know you know kind of internationally known clients that that really do match up really well with with what. I'm doing. She's interested in uh, like aesthetically what I'm into. Oh, I see. Um, She's commenting is, here. Yes, I was. Which, I, was the, I was the lucky one here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but she's she's really wonderful with working with these these kind of darker stories that are not necessarily like like you know really depressing or, or overly heavy. Like I'm I'm very interested in this this kind of um, dealing with these darker themes, but in a much more like a buoyant way. Um, and a little much more playful. Um, I love, you know, stories that, that can deal a little bit with humor um, that, that are ultimately ab about um, the kind of the everyday and the relationships we have in the everyday that, that deal with these, these kind of, um, these conceits of, of these maybe darker themes. But um, yeah, no, and it's, it's wonderful to have, to, to work with, I mean, before we sent this out on submission, Sue was very involved with the editing of this book as well. Um, and it's, it's really wonderful to make sure that when you're sending a book off, you can, you know, really um, believe that the product you're sending out is, is you know, mm. worth people's time. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a long one from SJ, Sarah Jane, so I'm going to leave that for a second. Uh, another anonymous viewer, um, what would be your new answer to your professor's question about your wildest dreams for, your, for this book? Um, just kind of thinking in retrospect or, or for, for like the future. Um, in, in retrospect, I'll just say like same thing, like the fact that any one person enjoyed reading this is, is still like, I'm, I'm just floored by that. Um, for hopes for what this book does, uh, I've already, all these boxes are checked. I am, I am just a pig in the mud, as they'd say in like South. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> Yeah, no, I am just absolutely thrilled. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled that this book is, you know, out here, that people are reading it, that people are enjoying it, that they're connecting to these characters that, that I really loved um, and that um, it, it took a while to get them on the page. But now that they're there, it's just wonderful to be able to, to share them and, and share this, this, you know, really weird story that I think is really fun. And, and for me, it's very moving. I find um, one of the questions I, I always like asking authors is, is that moment where you see 
a quote or a review from another author. A kind of, it's, oh and, and, and often, particularly from debut novelists, you get the kind of, I can't even believe that person is reading this book, let alone giving me a, a great review. Tell, right. Talk me through your top three. Uh, have you got a... a... <sighs> Gosh, I mean, okay. So there are ones that I'd never talked to that ended up you know, having these blurbs come back uh, where I was just shocked and absolutely floored to, to have them. And, and so grateful because they're doing, you know, what, what I, what I hope to do and, and, you know, having Jess Kidd and Ali Shaw come in so quickly um, and just to, to put these, these wonderful, beautifully written blurbs about this book, um, just when this, this, it was, you know, not even in a printed form yet is I'm still, you know, I'll always be grateful for that. And having Elizabeth Wetmore um, come in and I love her, her novel Valentine, um, which is just so beautiful. And her language is just so stunning that I, I was so floored and in her blurb, she talks about my language and I was like, oh my gosh, you don't know how much this means. Um, but um, having, you know, teachers who I went to the MFA, MFA for that I, I sought them out and I was like, I want to work under you. And then getting, um, their, their blurbs on it, whether it's Nita Day Gramont or Rebecca Lee or Clyde Edgerton. Um, I've just, I can't be more grateful um, for, for all these people, putting the time for reading the book and then, then crafting these beautiful blurbs and then you know having it on a book with my name on it. It's so cool. That's brilliant, isn't it? It's so amazing. I was thinking, because you're, you're, you're saying that it's kind of based around the house that you, you grew up in and your parents um, still live in that house. And, what do they make of your book? Have they given you a bit of a review and, and the fact that they're living in that house still? They love it. Um, and I, I think they're here, so hi. Um, but uh, they love they, the book. Perhaps they can answer the question in the, in the chat box. <laughs> right. Yes, and if they don't, I'll, I'll go ahead and give them the answer. And if they need to correct me or just disagree with me, <laughs> that's fine. We can ignore them if they're disagreeing. But um, yeah, so they, they love the book. They're huge fans of it. I think there was a, a window of time where my father uh, was responding to all the bumps in the house and saying like, oh no, you can come out at least, it's fine. Like come out. My mom was like, stop doing that. That's really <laughs> creepy. And he's like, oh, we can leave food out for her. It's just sad that she's in there. And I was like, I don't need this in my life. You're freaking me out. <laughs> that sort of leads into Sarah Jane's Tonks questions. Um, uh, it's, it's a long one, so bear with me. Some Classic uh, Gothic uh, novels are intimately tied to their location and the specific architecture of the house, the building, uh, where it's been set often features heavily in the creation of the novel's tone and atmosphere. Have you visited any buildings in person that sparked any inspiration other than obviously your own home uh, from growing up? But uh, there must be there must be other buildings around. I mean, you've you've, you've obviously traveled as well around the world as well uh, that, that have really sparked your imagination. I, uh, I, a lot of the, the kind of Southern plantation houses have, have really ple appealed to, to um, me when I was working on this project. There's some idiosyncratic things about the architecture in some of these, these buildings, whether it's the balloon frames, which actually have hollow spaces where someone can be in these, in, in, in these spaces between them fairly easily. And then seeing, uh, uh, or just, I, I mentioned St. Charles Avenue, um, earlier, they have so many beautiful, stunning houses that just seem really cumbersome. That seem like they're they're not, you know, perfectly structured and and, and uh, symmetrical, um, which would allow for these kind of these void spaces, these these spaces where you might have a spot that's kind of neglected or or um, where an add-on to a kitchen might have left a certain spot where someone might be able to fit in and and listen and. Yeah, no, it was it was experience. Uh, um, it was definitely um, something I was trying to do is just try to make us all more aware of our homes and the, the kind of objects and, and spaces that that we inhabit every day that we're supposed to know better than any other place, right? But yet still have all these surprises for us. Mm, tell you, I, I know that more than more than most people. We moved into this house eighteen months ago. Before that, it was the vets. <laughs> You imagine so the spirit of animals in here you know you'd have thought would be uh, you know anyway yeah it's, and maybe some living ones escape <laughs> <laughs> we still get people turning up at the door with their pets you know <laughs> wanting to <laughs> um, sadly um we, yeah i'm i'm, I'm not uh, that way uh, trained but uh, and uh, your it must be your mum beth is it beth that's right yeah we love it <laughs> <laughs> comment but uh, can i just pick you up on uh, on what that is in your um on your wall there is that a bird chart oh uh, it is a bird chart yes um, i've been that. having this up here yeah i've been um 
living in Texas lately and it's, it's um, I'm not used to the birds here. So it's actually a Texas wildlife chart. Um, so I'm, I'm getting acquainted with them. I've just put some bird feeders up in the backyard and uh, I'm making friends, which is great. I love that. I love that. I mean, it's something that's, you know, I mean, we massively in England and, and the United Kingdom were into and did doing that. So it's just wonderful to see um, to see that. We've 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 only got a few more minutes left, so do get any further questions in if if you want. Um, Lucy, I, I I don't know if you want to fill in a few um, further comments about your feelings for the book and 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 how you really enjoyed it. I am um, yeah. I mean, I I would love to know um, what you have planned next um, uh, because yes. Um, I, I loved it. I thought um, I, I you, you were talking about the house there. Now that isn't that isn't a sort of house I I would have had anything had any knowledge of before I read your book. But having read it, I felt like I was right there living it. Um, you have such a gift for description and for making you feel like you are living it right there with them. And those characters, they they just came to life for me and they stuck with me. And as I said, that relationship between Elise and Brody just. I just loved it. It was it was perfect. Um, so yeah, thank you. But yeah, I would I would love to know um, a what you have planned next, and b just if you have any advice for anyone out there that is sat thinking, should I put pen to paper? Um, you know, if, if they're watching, you know, what what would you say to them? Thank thank you for all of that, Lucy. And like you know, your your compliments are I I, I can't be more grateful for them, and I can't be more excited that that was your experience of this book as well. Um, that's just really thrilling for me. Um, for what I've got next, I'm just trying to kind of, um, I'm still working on, uh, I think a couple of projects, but but what I'm really excited about is just kind of appealing to um, the same things that I was excited about with Girl on the Walls, which is getting really wrapped up in a sense of place. And then some personalities of people that are doing things that they probably, that are a little idiosyncratic, that that aren't what other people do, but, but are doing it for very, um, real and, and um, difficult things that we're all dealing with, um, but they're just, you know, it's, it's quite intense for them. So this is how they're coping. Um, but in terms of you know, advice for, for other writers, I think the biggest thing you can do is, is obviously just get down and, and do it. Um, I think, uh, I, I mentioned this earlier, but with writer's block, I think writer's block of everybody's imaginative. We can all think of the most wild, crazy things. I think what stops us is, is when we start criticizing ourselves before that thing even becomes, uh, comes out to, uh, to fruition. And um, I think the best thing you can do is just allow yourself to be a kid, <laughs> to um, just have fun, be, just create whatever you want and, and leave the critical part of your brain for another day. Um, just get something out on the page first and, and shape that in, in whatever you, what way you want another time <laughs> yeah thank you i like that fantastic i think you've got um a sort of schedule of launches how many um what's next in terms of launches and for, for the book so uh for the rest of the day how many hours are left in the uk this is this is the uk launch um and then in the us we're gonna have the uh launch on may 11th brilliant brilliant and I, are there other countries that hopefully we'll get will um uh, move into uh, I guess there are some some other countries. I don't have the exact dates on those. I think uh, I will learn and I will know when maybe you guys learn. Um, but I'm really looking forward to them as well. Number of translations that I'm thrilled and I've, I've been in touch with some of the translators, which is crazy. Um, wow. And they're such artists as well to, to be able, you know, they're they're composing their own work of art as well with the translation. So it's it's been great talking to them. That's an art, isn't it? And, um, and who, who did the cover design? Because I'm really struck how amazing that is. And when you must have seen that, uh, it must have, that must have suddenly an idea that's just been a sort of a load of letters on a spreadsheet or something or on a, um, a Word document yeah. became, became an art, a piece of art. It must have been amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I seriously like it's incredible, um, and it, I, I love that you you referred to it that as a work of art because that's absolutely what it is too. Um, and it was Ellie with Fourth Estate kind of designed the the idea of it, and then we had Catherine Prowse, who's a um, stop motion animator. Um, she directed it and, and did these shots, and we had um, uh, someone else actually design the the clock itself. So this is this is a photograph of a real set. Um, that that was built and all these kind of individual hand-painted birds. This is all real. This was done. And the, the, there's a trailer for the book, which is just them filming the set um, kind of in a suspenseful way, zooming out through it. 
Um, so I, I haven't seen anything like this in terms of cover and and obviously I had no expectation of this and I'm, just I'm not, thrilled about I'm it. I'm not sure I've seen the animation. Is that is that out there somewhere? It is, yeah. It's on my um, Twitter. It's it's the pinned tweet. My handle's AJ, at AJ Ganusi, Um and it's it's the book trailer for the book. I'll which look is... it up. You can tell I'm all over this. I'm absolutely on top of uh, of all marketing things to do with book selling. <laughs> but... AJ, is, um, is that a granddaughter clock? This is, I think, from the height of it, it I would call it a granddaughter clock, yes. Nice, nice. Yes. Jake news uh, J jake says hello no he says uh, he says howdy <laughs> sorry howdy <laughs> howdy jake listen thank you so much um to to aj thank you so much to lucy and, and to everyone who's joined us it's been a wonderful uh wonderful hour such fun and congratulations on uh, on your achievement uh you're going through something that you know millions of people dream of and you've managed to do it you're you've, you've really you've smashed it out of the park so um, if I can use a baseball phrase, which I know New Orleans, is, Orleans is famous for its baseball, I think, isn't it? So <laughs> we, We've got it, or you can, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to everyone from both sides of the pond for joining us. It's been a wonderful event and uh, congratulations once more. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And we'll see you very soon, hopefully, um, when you come over to the UK, perhaps when you publish your second book. I would love that. Yes, and thank you so much for hosting this. This has been awesome. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much, guys. Bye-bye.